This is the first part of a crash course about climate the, entitled Climate Change, Serious But Not Hopeless. The first part concerns Earth's climate. Climate change is a geological problem, and I'm going to begin by explaining how. Coal is made from vegetation that's pressed together in rocks, and that process takes millions of years. In just tens of years, we burn that coal, convert it to CO2, and put it into the atmosphere. On the left, it's a geological process taking millions of years, and on the right, an anthropogenic process. That's one caused by ourselves. It's the imbalance in time that's the problem. The coal takes millions of years to form, but just tens of years to burn. I'm going to begin this course by explaining the controls of climate that act on geological timescales. Remember, that's millions of years. Those controls are solar energy, that's heat we re receive from the sun, albedo, which I will explain shortly, and the greenhouse effect. To explain those three controls, I'm going to begin with a question. The question is as follows. Which planet is warmest? And the follow-up question is why? So take a second and decide which of these two planets is warmest. Well, the average temperature of the Earth is 15 degrees centigrade. That's including one degree, uh, which is anthropogenic global warming, global warming caused by humans. The temperature on Venus is 464 degrees, so it's quite a lot warmer. But the interesting question is why? So let's look at those three controls of climate and see how they contribute to the temperatures of Venus and the Earth. We'll begin with solar energy. You can liken solar energy to a radiator. If you want to get more warmer, you would go closer to the radiator. If you wanted to get cooler, you'd go further away. The sun functions as a great big radiator warming up the planets. Venus is closer to the sun and it gets more heat. Heat's measured in units of watts. That's the same units that are used to measure the uh, power in your microwave oven. We consider now a square meter on the surface of Venus, and yet that square meter receives 658 watts. That's about enough uh, to pop popcorn in a microwave oven. A simple calculation will show us that that amount of heat would give Venus a temperature of 55 degrees centigrade, far from its real temperature of 464. Earth is further away, it receives less heat. It receives 342 watts for every square meter, which is enough to give Earth a temperature of 6 degrees. So those temperatures are not the actual temperatures of the planets, so we know there must be more involved. So now let's consider albedo. And I'm going to use my cat to help explain how albedo works. My cat is white, and that's the important thing. White surfaces reflect heat. So when my cat sits out in the sun, she does not absorb that much heat, it just reflects off her white coat. That ability to reflect heat is called albedo, so the white cat has high albedo. This white cat, however, is quite smart, it sat on a black seat. Now black and dark colours absorb heat, which means they have low albedo. So the cat is now sitting on a warm seat, keeping itself warm. Now let's look at the planets. Venus is atmosphere. You could imagine it somewhat like the cat's fur. It's very pale colored, which means that Venus will have high albedo. For that reason, much of the heat that Venus receives is bounced back into space. And once we subtract that heat, the temperature on Venus would only be minus 46 degrees centigrade. The albedo of the Earth is far more complicated because it has both dark parts and light parts. The oceans are dark and they absorb heat. The clouds are light, they reflect heat. The polar ice caps are light and they also reflect heat. Averaged out, it's about a third of the heat that gets sent back into space. Um, taking that heat away, the temperature on the Earth would be minus 18 degrees centigrade. So we're clearly not at the correct temperatures, so solar energy and albedo together cannot explain um, the temperatures on Venus or the Earth.
So we now need to introduce the third factor, which is the greenhouse effect. And my cat will explain this for us too. Here, the white cat has crept underneath a black blanket. She's under the blanket to preserve her own body's heat. She creates an artificial greenhouse around herself, keeping her own heat in. She's a smart cat because she's chosen a black blanket. The black blanket has low albedo, so it's quite warm. It absorbs heat. So she's got a win-win situation. Let's take a look at the Earth. Earth's greenhouse is created by its atmosphere. And in that atmosphere, there's a very important greenhouse gas, and that's called carbon dioxide, CO2. 0.04% of Earth's atmosphere is CO2. That About one quarter of that is CO2 that we have released by burning fossil fuels and other processes. CO2 and other greenhouse gases are sufficient to raise Earth's temperature by 32 degrees and another degree, that's the anthropogenic degree that's caused by us, bringing Earth's temperature to 15 degrees centigrade. To really understand the impact of CO2, let's take a look at Venus, because Venus has an atmosphere with 96.5% CO2, which is enough to raise its temperature by 510 degrees reaching 464 degrees centigrade. So let's summarize those controls of Earth's climate. Solar energy, if solar energy increases, the temperature will increase. Albedo, if albedo increases, the temperature will decrease. The greenhouse effect, if the greenhouse effect increases, the temperature will increase. Now, over long geological times, remember that's millions of years, the amount of solar energy we receive, albedo and the greenhouse effect, vary naturally. Yet Earth's temperature stays fairly constant. And that's because Earth has an inbuilt thermostat. Let me explain what a thermostat is. So a thermostat is something that controls the temperature, for example, in a room. Let's say we wanted to keep the temperature between 13 and 15 degrees centigrade, so similar to the Earth. Um, and lots of people op go out, open the door, go out from the room, and cold air comes in so that the temperature drops. The thermostat detects that temperature drop and puts on the heating, causing the temperature to rise. But if it just kept rising, it would become too hot. So when, it reaches, when the temperature gets high enough, it triggers the thermostat, which turns the heating off, and the temperature falls. And then when it gets too cold, the thermostat turns the heating back on again. And in this way, the temperature is kept regulated um, close to, in, the, in this example, 14 degrees. Now, Earth's thermostat is the weathering of rocks. Let's take a simple rock like granite. It's hard to imagine, but granite is actually soluble. If you leave it for a million years in a glass of water, it will start to dissolve. So granite will react with water and dissolve. But if that water was acidic, it would dissolve faster. And CO2 from the atmosphere makes the water acidic, and the granite will dissolve more quickly. It'll only take hundreds of thousands of years. When granite dissolves, it breaks down to form clay. But clay is fundamentally different than granite because it contains different chemi chemicals. Clay contains less potassium and sodium than granite does, which means that there will be potassium and sodium left over. These are in solution, so they are ions. That's with a positive charge, so they're cations. Now, cations must have partner anions, that's ions with a negative charge, to maintain charge balance. The anion in this case, is bicarbonate. Notice that the CO2, which was a greenhouse gas, is now in the bicarbonate, which is soluble. Once it's soluble, it's no longer a greenhouse gas. And it is then transported by rivers until it reaches the ocean. In the ocean, bicarbonate reacts with calcium and forms limestone. So let's summarize the process of the weathering of rocks. So CO2 in the atmosphere reacts with rocks such as granite 
and become soluble. In dissolved form, it's carried to the oceans, where it precipitates out as limestone. So this process removes CO2 from the atmosphere. And you would be justified now asking, how does that make it a thermostat? Surely it would just make the Earth cooler. Well, let's look at that. Let's take a situation that the Earth becomes slowly warming, warmer because of natural processes. So we have, we have some natural global warming causing the temperature to rise. Well, the weathering of rocks is a chemical reaction. If it gets hotter, it will go faster. So we'll have faster weathering of rocks. Now that effectively turns the heating off. And let me explain how. That weathering of rocks consumes CO2. So that means there'll be less CO2 in the atmosphere, which means that the greenhouse effect weakens, which makes the Earth cooler. So the temperature goes down. Well, that triggers the thermostat. Because then, because it's cooler, the weathering of rocks will be slower. And that puts the heating back on because there's less ability of the Earth to take up the CO2 and there's more CO2 left in the atmosphere. That causes the greenhouse effect to strengthen and the temperature to rise. So this is Earth's thermostat and it holds the temperature stable over periods of millions of years. You could then just be justified in asking, can the weathering of rocks remove the CO2 we release to the atmosphere? The answer is, unfortunately, no. And the reason is simple. It comes back to the timescales I talked about at the beginning of this lecture. We release CO2 to the atmosphere 1,000 times faster than CO2 is removed from the atmosphere by the weathering of rocks. So let's visualize that. By burning fossil fuels, we're going to release 1,000 molecules of CO2. After that's done, we're going to take the same time period again and see how many molecules of CO2 are removed by the weathering of rocks. One. That leaves 999 molecules of our 1,000 remaining in the atmosphere. And that excess CO2 leads to global warming, which is the topic of the second part of this crash course.